Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I am joined by Jim Morris, author of The Dreaming Circus. Jim joins me to talk about his journey from being a self-described angry psychedelic outlaw after his return from Vietnam to a spiritual warrior through a deep exploration of the works of Carlos Castaneda and the Toltec wisdom of Don Miguel Ruiz. Also, please be sure to subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts or the YouTube channel. Also, hit that like button and notification bell. Your support is truly appreciated. Retired U.S. Army Special Forces Major Jim Morris served three tours with the Green Berets in Vietnam. He has worked as a civil rights advocate for the mountain peoples with whom he fought, the Montagnard, and his Vietnam memoir, War Story, won the first Bernal Diaz Award for military nonfiction. He has covered wars for Rolling Stone, Soldier of Fortune, Esquire, and the Saturday Evening Post. For decades, he has immersed himself in a deep study of Toltec shamanism. The Dreaming Circus is his latest book. Jim, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Glad to be here, Nick. Okay, well, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to speak with you. I really enjoyed your book, The Dreaming Circus, and I love the title, by the way. I thought it was a great title for the book. It was, I found it to be a very fun read and one of the most entertaining, I think, spiritual biographies I've ever read. And I wanted to ask you, though, do you think that's fair to identify it as a spiritual biography? Yeah, that was the intention, and I like to think I brought it off. Okay, yeah, Yeah, I I think you did. And I thought it would be important to be clear that it's not a book of spiritual teaching so much, although there is lots of wisdom within it. Uh, And I think you even note at one point in the book that it's not a prescription for the path of the reader or a path that the reader has to follow, but you, I think, refer to it as a recommendation, a recommendation for the readers to find a teacher and a community. It seems that you wrote it largely for veterans, for other veterans. You wrote it for yourself, I think, as well. At one point, you also noted that you wrote it for single moms with only sons and only sons with single moms. Yeah, that's, well, that was my situation. And uh, it's it's a complicated and difficult situation. So if those people can pick up a pointer, I'd be happy about that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, you have a, you've lived a very interesting life. You spent time at military school. You were raised by a single mom. You served three tours of duty in Vietnam. You've been a war correspondent. So it seems like the warrior archetype, if I can call it that, has been really the dominant archetype in your life and spiritual journey. Would you agree with that? Do you think that's fair? Yeah, it's fair. It's uh an oversimplification, but it's fair. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Well, let me uh, ask, in what ways is it an oversimplification? Because I also wanted to ask you how you would kind of, uh, what that archetype would mean to you. So if we can expand on it, perhaps. The archetype, gosh. Okay, let's let's switch to the spiritual angle for a second here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Carlos Castaneda's teacher, Don Juan, says that the principal difference between the warrior and the average man is that whereas the average man sees everything as either a blessing or a curse, the warrior sees everything as a challenge. Mm. And that that's not really, that's quite aside from the usual conception of warrior, which is fighter. Right. Well, I was, you know, I was raised to fight in World War II during World War II. So, of course, <laughs> it was over by the time I was ready to go to that, that job. The warrior archetype, the people who are warriors in our society are like soldiers, policemen, athletes. Mm. But everybody has a little bit of that because everybody has conflict in their life and everybody has 
conflicts to resolve. So, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a universal archetype. Right. Right. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of, um, well, there's, there's a book of archetypes right. that I, I, I subscribe to. Mm-hmm. And um, oddly enough, my primary warrior archetype is not Aries or Mars. It's Athena. Mm. You know, because Athena is the strategist. And that's, that's, that's my warrior thing. That's right. what I used to do is walk the trails trying to figure out ways to ambush them instead of being ambushed by them Mm -hmm. and uh, but yeah i was i was raised that way i went to military school when i was 12 11 actually Mm -hmm. and had two years of that then i was a civil air patrol cadet then i went back to a better military school and um so you know if world war ii ever comes around again i'll I'll be ready (laughs) yeah yeah i don't know it might uh, of course, then, you know, it'll be three. Well, the, one of the reasons I wanted to ask you about that warrior archetype is because the teachings that you, that seem to have been most influential to you have been the teachings of Carlos Castaneda and Don Miguel Ruiz, uh, yeah, who cool. wrote the Four Agreements and several other books. And they both talk about the, the, the path of the warrior. And like you said, it doesn't just mean someone who fights. There is much more depth to it. And I also was thinking in terms of Chogim Trungpache's book, Shambhala, The Sacred Path of the Warrior. And Mm -hmm. uh, I had a guest on uh, several months ago, Angel Millar, who wrote a book called The Path of the Warrior Mystic. And it seems to be a... uh, a really good archetype now for men and for men's spirituality. I think it applies for women as well, but it's more than just fighting. Like you said, it's meeting a challenge. And, and I think it's the, the challenge of the world, the challenge of how we live in the world and the challenge of bettering ourselves. Well, that that's true. Okay. When i First, okay, when I first started studying Castaneda, which was after, after Vietnam, and I didn't have, I was badly in need of an attitude adjustment after Vietnam. You know, I mean, the life that I'd built for myself was gone. Hmm. And I wasn't that thrilled with the life that I was introduced to, which was mostly being a tech writer in Norman, Oklahoma. But when I started studying Castaneda, he has, it's, he has a series of techniques, and I, I'm going to discuss briefly some of them. One of them is lose self-importance. That's the first one, the one that I ignored the most. Um, <laughs> erase personal history, the idea there being that whenever people have an idea of you, they're, you're kind of a, a prisoner of it. You know, you wind up playing, playing the role you, you've, been, you've assigned yourself. Use death as an advisor which, you know, that's, that's pretty good advice because you're not going to live forever and it's, you'd best plan the use of your time among, among other lessons from that. And the other one is accept responsibility for your own acts. Well, when I first went to Vietnam, I was 26. I was executive officer, the second in command of a special forces aid detachment in the central highlands. And I was, that six months was the happiest six months of my life up until then. Um, I mean, I felt we were doing those people a lot of good. I mean, for one thing, we were the only employer for those people in the province. And so whatever money they had came from us. But also we we treated, I think we treated some 6,000 patients or our, med- our medics did in that six months. And anyway, we did them a lot of good. Uh, one of my, okay, the tribe we worked with has the largest inf- incidence of leprosy in the world, 0.6%. And they treated them, it was a Stone Age tribe. They treated them exactly like they treated lepers in the Bible. They just threw them out. 
And so in connection with the local missionary of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, Bob Reed, and the local USAID guy, we built them a village. Or we didn't build them a village. We provided them uh, with the materials to build their own village. And we provided them with food until they could get in a crop. We provided them with soap in the form of Prell shampoo, which was amazingly popular. Uh, the women loved those Prell bottle caps because they put them in their ears. <laughs> and, and they had loops in their ears. And they put those, before that, they just had these kind of crappy old ivory plugs. And uh, so they loved the plastic. Well, anyway, um, that, but the, truly the scaredest I ever was in Vietnam was splitting a jug of rice wine with the chief of that village <laughs> off the same straw. Mm. And so, so yeah, I had a, a sense of accomplishment. But the thing was, I didn't have a sense of self-importance because I wasn't, you know, I mean, we were in the middle of this huge uh, conflict and I was just one little guy. So there was, there was no way I could crank a, self, a sense of self-importance into that. I didn't have a personal history there. I'd only been there like, well, less than six months because we were only there six months. I had to use death as advisor, advisor because, you know, people were shooting at me. Mm -hmm. And I had to accept responsibility for my own acts because I was in charge. So I was quite unwittingly and long before I'd ever learned them, using those disciplines exactly the way they're supposed to be used and it worked like a charm i just i just felt great the mm -hmm. whole time and that's when i say i felt great i had i had diarrhea for six months <laughs> and there were a lot of other things that were not all that swell but but yeah i was happy yeah. and uh, being happy was not something i was really that used to yeah yeah my dad uh, did two tours in Vietnam and he was actually in uh, uh, special weapons, not special forces, but special weapons. Um, I think in Vietnam, he was a scout, but my dad, he would never speak about his experiences in Vietnam. Um, <clears throat> well, but, there's two kinds, there's two kinds of guys that do that. The ones that will never talk about it and the ones that won't shut up about it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was the second. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he. I, I have no knowledge of what my dad went through in Vietnam. I have no uh, no clue at all uh, because he, like I said, he just he would never speak about it. But it's interesting because you say that first six months was the happiest for you, but then that changed. Now, when you did the three tours, was it back to back? Because I think my dad's was back to back. Um, well, the, did okay, you come the home one. and then go back? The first one was what, what is called a TDY tour, temporary duty tour, okay. six months. Uh, and we were, we were sent from Okinawa as a team. Mm. Okay. Well, none of us wanted to go. We wanted to stay there and finish the job we'd started because, you know, 80% of what we accomplished was accomplished in the last two months we were there. Mm. And because it took that long to, you know, find out where all the trees were and stuff. Then I went back to Okinawa, uh, was put in a job I didn't want. In fact, the last thing the group commander said to me while I was there was get out of my office hmm. because I was telling him I just didn't want his damn job. It, it was being the public information officer. So then I got, I got my own team, but we didn't go back to the same place. So everything, everything that I'd learned, it was a different war. You know, I mean, we were, we were only maybe 200 miles away, but, uh, the terrain was different. The tribes were different. The enemy was different. You know, the first time we were, it was VC, then it was, then it was NVA. And so I had to start all over again and it was okay. I mean, I was the boss. I was 26 years old. I had 1,700 people working for me, which that doesn't usually happen when you're 26. So it was uh, it was very challenging, but I only lasted three and a half months because I pushed too hard and I got hit and uh, sent back to Okinawa. The deal I had with my my wife was that I would put in my the original deal was I'd put in my two years in the army and get out and. Uh, we'd go back to Oklahoma and I'd get a job or whatever. But 
I caught that tour on Okinawa through a kind of a bureaucratic maze that I went into to get to jump school. And uh, so I wound up spending five years in the army, but I went, I agreed, I'd agreed to get out. So I got out and I went back to Oklahoma, hated it. And it was maybe two years before I went back. And uh, this time I went to Vietnam with special forces again for 12 months, but I was a pretty senior captain. I still had my idea that I wanted to go back to where I'd been in the first place, reactivate my own intelligence net and do some interesting stuff. And instead <clears throat> I was okay. My title was civil affairs, psychological operations for the first six months. So I was in charge of faith and good works. And again, it was, it was good work. I was doing, uh, I had a newsletter in five languages. I had a, believe it or not, I had a pig breeding program. Uh, I didn't take too much personal interest in that one, but you know, it was, it, it was an interesting job. And then I got called to the group headquarters to do a staff study on full row, uh, which was the mountain yard separatist organization. And I knew quite a bit about that. So, and while I was there, I ran into my old CO from, uh, from Okinawa and he told the group commander, I was the best information officer in the army. And so I never got out on a trong. I just, I just got plugged into another administrative job and I, I didn't want to do that. As it turned out, as usual, when you're railing against your plans, not working out, what's actually happening, happening is if you apply yourself to it and work it right is maybe where, exactly where you ought to be. Cause that really was exactly where I, where I should have been. I was, I had a, a again, I was back in the magazine business. Uh, I did a lot of, I covered a lot of stories and I could go anywhere I wanted to. I had 12 guys working for me and they were great guys, just super kids. And, uh, if I hadn't had this idea that I should be doing something else, I would have been very happy doing what I was doing. And it seems like the most difficult part of the war for you. And I think that it, this is true for many was in the coming home. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, I just, I just felt like fish out of water. I didn't, uh, well, I, I got pretty lucky. I took a, a I was, went to grad school and was working towards an MA in journalism, but it was in professional writing, not straight journalism. Uh, the writing program had been in the English department. And when the guy who had organized the program, who had a PhD in English died, his two assistants were old pulp fiction writers and the English department did not want those guys. So, but, uh, Foster Harris, my mentor and the head of that department was, uh, friends with, um, the head of the journalism department. So they just took him over. They just took over the program. So that's why I have a degree in journalism instead of English, I guess. But I took a, a, a screenwriting course and the guy who was teaching the course was the head of the, the OU research institutes tech writing shop. And, uh, he was next an GI and, uh, you know, I write well, so he hired me and uh, that was, that was a pretty interesting job. The first couple of years weren't bad, but things kind of fell apart, uh, for me. My marriage fell apart. Then another marriage fell apart. Then I got in another marriage that was doomed to fall apart. Is, is there a pattern starting to emerge here? But. Uh, Somewhere along in there, I got another tech writing job for the post office department and they gave me six months to do this job. And I had completed one third of it by noon the first day. So I thought, well, I got to find something to fill the time and, um, to cut to the chase, I started reading Castaneda and I edited the first, the teaching parts of the first four Castaneda books into a sorcerer's manual. Mm. And in the process, I really learned that system and I started to practice it 
and it worked for me. I mean, my life had slowly and progressively fallen apart. It was centrifugal. And then after I got into the Castaneda stuff, it became centripetal. It sort of slowly started coming together and things started working for me. And I started having fun. And uh, well, it, it just, it's, it started me on a path of spiritual exploration. Mm. And uh, with many, many by, byways, you know, I studied the Course in Miracles, um, blah, blah, blah. I took Aikido. I, I'm going to look, my, what I do best is tell stories. So I'm going to digress yeah, and tell the fine. story. Uh, there's one of the places, okay. When I was working at Dell in New York, my boss was a woman named Marilyn Abraham, who is just delightful. I mean, I loved then and still to this day love Marilyn Abraham. She was a wonderful person. And she was in, she and I were both kind of into the new age stuff. And we wanted to start a new age line at Dell. Well, we never were able to do that. But I did a lot of work preparatory to setting it up. And one of the people I met was a guy named Ralph White at the New York Open Center. Uh, Ralph was a Brit, and at that point, I was I was taking Aikido in in New York, and Ralph White was an Aikidoka. Well, it turned out that he was a friend of the Thane of Cawdor, not the one in Shakespeare, the current Thane of Cawdor. It's a real it's it's a real title. He's a real guy, and the Thane of Cawdor was an Aikidoka. And he had a dojo in his dungeon. And I just thought that was one of the most wonderful thing, one of the most wonderful facts that had ever come my way. I just flat loved that. So anyway, I, I did that for quite a while. And then another marriage fell apart. And I got a job as an editor in LA for a company that tanked seven months later. And uh, well, anyway, I, I fiddled around and managed to survive, which was the, the great spiritual lesson of that period was you'll survive. You will survive. It may be tough, but you'll survive. And I did. And uh, but somewhere along in there, I actually got involved. I actually became a student of Don Miguel Ruiz and and some of his uh, I took some classes from Miguel and I took a lot of classes from people who had been his students, his, his original apprentices. And, you know, I had learned how to describe that system by studying Castaneda and a little about how to make it work. But working with those people, I built myself a nice life. Yeah. And, and almost everybody I knew that was with me on through there has done that. I had one friend, we were, we were going to lunch. This was after we'd been through all the training. And uh, I drove past one of the major hospitals in LA and she said, I've been in that hospital six times. And I said, um, really, why? And she said, suicide attempts. Oh, that's not good. Well, now she's got a PhD in clinical psych and she's helping people who are in the same boat she used to be in. and quite successful at it. So, you know, that's, the, that's the kind of things that we did there. Right. Right. Well, and I think that it's pretty common in many ways that spiritual work is healing work. And, yeah. uh, you know, you, you wrote that when you came back from Vietnam, you described yourself as a angry psychedelic outlaw. And, and that's a line I love, by the way, and that you also noted that you had various counselors throughout the years trying to encourage you to apply for PTSD disability. And so it seemed like there was something that the spiritual journey for you was a healing journey. And I wanted to kind of go through that a little bit because and you've already kind of set the framework there with Castaneda and uh, then Don Miguel Ruiz, but you also write a little bit about your experiences with LSD. Did that precede? Is that something that helped lead you to Castaneda or did Castaneda come first? Well, obviously it was a, it was a factor. Yeah. Um, 
but no, I okay. I I'm a, I read constantly. Right. I'm sure you're pretty much have the same problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, so, but one, but you know, I I was I was a huge fan of Tom Wolfe's new journalism, mm. and I was a huge fan of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Sometimes a Great Notion. So when I found out that Tom Wolfe had written a book about Ken Kesey having absolutely no idea what was in it, I immediately bought it and read it. And that's, I mean, I'd heard of LSD. It was in the news at the time. But reading that book, I just thought, okay, you know, this is really interesting. And my friend Zoltan uh, was into it. And, um, okay, I belong to this, um, well, I, we were all writing students and we would meet in Hester Robertson cafeteria and drink coffee, far too much coffee, gallons of coffee and, and tell stories. And, you know, that's, I mean, we're all storytellers and, and we were all natural storytellers. It was hard to make us stop. And Zoll had, he he'd had the story. He had gone to, he dropped out of OU for a year and got into the writing program at Iowa, which is the most literary writing program in the country. And it, it, it wasn't, he didn't, he was not impressed by it. It was, you know, they were writing novels with no characters and no plots and, you know, ex real experimental fiction. But um, uh, I forget. Oh, Thomas Edison was the one who said 999 out of a, out of a thousand experiments fail. And Zola was seeing a lot of failed experiments in Iowa. But he did one afternoon go to a party at, at Kurt Vonnegut's daughter's house out in the country, and it was in the middle of a blizzard. And uh, he was he was tripping for the party. And he left the party and he was going back to town and he said, I was driving on the oldest, baldest tires imaginable. And there were cars in the ditches on both sides of me all the way back to town, all the way back to uh, Iowa City. And he said, I was tripping and I willed myself down into those tires and gripped the road and just drove home. And I said, I've got to try that stuff. And he said, Thursday. Mm. So I went by his house Thursday and he loaded me up on a half a tab of orange sunshine and my life changed rather dramatically. Yeah. You but, also at some point skydive on LSD. Is that right? I did do that once. Yeah. 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 Not recommended. Yeah. Um, yeah. Don't try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now I will say that I found out actually after I was out here, I have a, a friend, Bob Cohen, who is the owner, executive producer, whatever title he's given himself for revolution films. Uh, Bob is, uh, he is the most liberal, basically he's a communist, you know, and a uh, sweet guy. And he did a, a movie called Mondo Hollywood, which was mm. all about gypsy boots and the, uh, gypsy boots and the Hollywood characters. And one of the Hollywood characters had been the world skydiving championship, skydiving champion. And this dude used to jump on LSD all the time. And uh, I don't, I don't think he came to a bad end. I don't mean that he hammered in, but uh, I think he got kind of burnt, but I did it once and it was, well, for one thing, that was the end of my mach of machismo for me, because mm -hmm. if you still got anything to prove after you skydived on acid, the only thing you're proving <laughs> is you're crazy, you know? And uh, I did have a malfunction, a shoot malfunction. That was the first time that happened. And so I had to handle the malfunction and bring myself in while tripping. And I had to focus really fast and really tight, but I, but I did it. I brought myself in. It was okay. Yeah. And um, uh, I did it kind of as a, I just wanted to test the limits of what you could do on LSD. Hmm. I once, well, I had a whole, uh, I collected a, a list of the oddest things that I know that people have done on LSD. One of them was a guy who played in a Big Ten basketball tournament game on LSD. 
they, he won, his team won. I think he was playing for OU. I knew a girl who had played the clarinet in the OU marching band during halftime ceremonies in Owen Stadium on LSD, which I can't even imagine that. Uh, Zoll also con convinced my father to try LSD, hmm. and he did that a couple of times. And he had, oh, and he convinced the DA in his hometown. <laughs> I mean, the guy didn't try it until after he was out of office, but he was back visiting in their, their hometown and he ran into Zoltan's mom and he says, tell Zoltan he was right about everything. <laughs> so, and, oh yeah. And one, uh, one of the guys that I used to skydive with was in the Navy ROTC. Uh, he worked his way through college with a combination of Navy ROTC and selling weed and went to Pensacola to become a jet pilot. And that would have been about 1971. Hmm. And he found out that all his instructors were acid heads. Wow. So, so he asked one of his instructors, he said, well, what happens if you have a flashback while you're trying to land on a carrier and it just goes around to the left? And his instructor said, you follow it on around. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, I had run into him. He was he was out trying to score, yeah. and uh, and he told me that story. Um, so, yeah, the LSD thing, uh, but that that lasted almost exactly three years. One of the one of the nice things about LSD is it's it's no part of addictive. It's there's right. nothing addictive about it. And when I started, I felt like I was you know too uptight, and after three years, I felt like I was getting too loose and I just poured my stash down the toilet. And that was the end of that. Oh. So, uh, you know, and, and one of the things I pointed out on another interview is that the stuff I was doing that was illegal then is now being prescribed for pe to people to do it for the same things I was doing it for. Right. 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 And, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, there's been a, I guess that people are saying that they're calling it the psychedelic renaissance. And there's been a lot of uh, studies that have been done for LSD and psilocybin mushrooms and MDMA to help with a variety of psychological uh, kind of issues and been demonstrated that they are clearly effective. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, they're very good. And they, they just help you get, they help you drop a lot of baggage for one thing. Yeah, yeah. So you, just, you just suddenly realize, oh, this is baggage. I should drop it. And right. there it goes. Well, I, I just wanted to ask you about it because it seemed like that was something that sort of launched you on this spiritual healing journey that you describe in the book. Well, yeah, in a way. I mean, I, I was... I, you know, stuff that I'd read about, I'd read Huxley, I'd read a couple other people, and I realized that people were having spiritual insights from LSD. And uh, yeah, I wanted to see the Jefferson airplane, but I also wanted some spiritual insights. Sure, sure. And uh, I did both of those things. Yeah. So you mentioned that, you know, you started, you were reading Castaneda when you were working for the post office. And that you kind of, I guess, uh, condensed out the the practices. Yeah. And uh, have you ever, uh, did you ever? I'll send it that? to you if you're interested. I've still got it. It's in my. Yeah, book. yeah. I'd love to read that. Yeah. I was curious if you had ever published it or considered publishing it. Or... I can't. It's all, it's all copyrighted material. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, okay. I had, okay. This is another story, but. Uh, I was doing a PR job in Oklahoma City, and well, I had 50 copies of that little manual made. It's mm -hmm. it, the teaching parts in, in the first four Castaneda books came out to, I think, about 60 pages, mm -hmm. something like that. And I had 50 copies made up to give to people that I thought would help it. 
And I sent a copy to, who's a very famous editor, Castaneda's editor, and probably before this is over, I'll think of his name, but it's not coming to me now. In any case, I got a, uh, I got a letter from Simon and Schuster's lawyer. It was a cease and desist letter. Wow. And, um, uh, you know, you can't publish it. You can't, you know, you can't speak it aloud. You can't, it was, you know, it was really <laughs> restricted. And so I wrote them back and I said, well, look, I'm not, I don't want to make money off of Dr. Castaneda's work. That's not, that's not my goal. Uh, I do want to show a few copies of this to friends. And if that's a problem for you, then sue me in federal court in Oklahoma City and we'll decide whether Carlos Castaneda has published somebody else's lesson plans, AKA Don Juan's, <laughs> or whether he is whether he was written fiction and all of his books will have to be moved over from the nonfiction shelves to the fiction shelves in every library in the world. And we'll decide that in federal court in Oklahoma City. Now Think for a moment, if you're a New York lawyer, how badly you want to spend six months in Oklahoma City. And I got back a letter from that guy it was the nicest letter I've ever received from anyone. <laughs> and the idea was, no, if you just want to show a few friends, we don't care. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, it, and they probably, aside from wanting to not want to spend time in Oklahoma City, there's my understanding is that there are some legitimate concerns regarding the reality of Don Juan. Um, oh yeah. Uh, well, uh, there, there are, okay. Castaneda says quite openly that he's changed things that Don Juan's right. name is not Don Juan that, you know, right. he's changed. The question is how much has he changed Right. and how much has he made up and how much is legit and how much is not. Yeah. And it's a, you know, I mean, there are many, many people who are originally Castaneda fanciers who have just written him off as a fraud and a trickster. And well, I mean, okay, his his spirit animal is Coyote. Coyote is the trickster. So, what do you expect from a from a from a shaman whose spiritual spirit animal is Coyote and whose playground is L.A.? Yeah, you know. I mean, it's, that's Castaneda and, uh, but that doesn't invalidate the teachings. Right. Yeah. You know? I agree with that. I think that there's still value in the teachings. There's still wisdom there. Yeah. And, you know, I think some of his stories, uh, some of the incidents in, in his books maybe have taken place in dreams and he wrote them up like they were real hmm. and um, all kinds of stuff like that. But yeah. there are, okay. Victor Sanchez, for instance, is a Toltec teacher. And this guy has made a career out of doing the exercises that Castaneda describes for his students. I mean, he takes people out into the woods and hangs them up in a tree upside down and leaves them there all night to think their way, you know, the various exercises that Castaneda has tried. And to the point where Castaneda's, okay, he left his, his legacy is a thing called the Queer Green Society, and they sued Victor Sanchez. And um, so the, the end result of it is he didn't stop teaching it, but he only teaches it in Mexico and he doesn't come to the United States. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so after Castaneda, you... I think the next major influence for you, and we've been talking about this a little bit, was the work of Don Miguel Ruiz, the yeah. Toltec shamanism and wisdom there. And did you do you find much overlap or similarities between what Castaneda was doing and what? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. There's like an eighty percent overlap. Yeah, yeah. Because I was seeing some. <clears throat> Don Miguel teaches the same stuff. Mm -hmm. um, his approach is quite different because whereas Castaneda played it mysterioso, you know, I mean, it was, mm -hmm. well, you know, you read that stuff and, and you're, it's like reading it, reading Castaneda is like mountain climbing at dusk in a mist. <laughs> I mean, you know, and Miguel just lays it out there and it's clear. Well, for one thing, 
when he wrote the four agreements, I mean, English is a second language for him mm. and as it was for Castaneda, but it was a fairly recent second language. <clears throat> and his whole goal was to make it clear and simple and understandable. And the four agreements are, are you know, he says that if you learn the four agreements and practice them, 85% of your troubles will go away. And that has been my experience, mm. you know, and I, I just have them, I, I've memorized them. I can recite them for you here if you like, but I've memorized them. And when I don't, when I don't feel right about things, I just go through the four agreements and say, which one or more of these am I violating at this time? And I figure out which one it is. And then I figure out how I'm violating it. And then I stop doing that. And whatever it is, just goes away. Yeah. Why, why don't we say what the four agreements are for anyone who may not be familiar with them? Put okay. you on the spot here. <laughs> so you don't think anything personally. Always do your best. Be impeccable with your word and don't make assumptions yeah that's yeah, all good advice that's not the correct order but uh, yeah they work like a charm they're great and they're they're kind of parallels to those four things that i said from castaneda but i'd have to stop and figure out how the parallels work to do it and i'm not going to it would bore people to tears yeah yeah well i i, I see that uh the the, the connections there with the you know, uh, with Castaneda that don't focus on personal history. There's no personal history yeah, um, yeah. or to move beyond your personal history. Um, yeah. Because I think that that is this idea of the stories that we're always telling ourselves about oh, who sure. we are. Right. And that we can change the stories. Well, okay. I'll give you an example. One of the things, have you ever been in a sense depth tank? Do you know anything about yes. this? Yes, I have. Yeah. Well, you probably have in uh, like Boulder, you know, that's where I, that's the first time I did, it was in Boulder and I was in there and I just broken up with one of my past wives and, you know, I was lying there, all my senses totally blanked out. I couldn't see anything. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't smell anything and whatever other senses were left. I couldn't do that either. But I was still there, still lying there thinking, you did this to me, you bitch. Mm. And then I thought, whatever anybody ever did to you, nobody is doing it to you now. It's just in your head. And probably at least 50% of the time, you were railing about it outside in the world. It was just in your head. So drop it jenny and um i won't say that i've perpetually dropped it from that moment on but you know i always catch myself All right well and that that feeds into do your best i mean we can't be perfect and drop right. everything and all these all at once but it's this sort of constant work to do to try to improve and to stop ourselves from telling these harmful narratives yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it was interesting because I was also thinking in terms of, and I, you know, I, I, I haven't read all of Castaneda's works. I, I've read Journey to Exelon and I've read it twice. The first one, first time was, shoot, back in like 94, I think. I, I have writing. to say at some point they get kind of wonky. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I I reread it a couple of years ago and I still find a lot of value to it. And I think that the, the one aspect that I really liked about the journey to Ixalan is this whole notion. And you mentioned this a little bit of death as your companion. Death is your yeah. great advisor because it's not just the knowledge that we're all mortal beings, but if you take your death seriously, if you take your mortality seriously, you're not going to waste your days away watching TikTok videos or binging something on Netflix. Uh, no, that's, that's ill-advised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but I saw that, that Don Miguel Ruiz 
also says something very similar uh, along those lines, I think. Yeah, he, he, um, he personalizes the angel of death. Mm. And one of the, uh, one of the exercises, okay, one of Miguel's big innovations and, and one that is just, okay, is, is he has a three day ceremony that you go through when you visit Teotihuacan. And one of them is you stop in front of this little river that runs through the, the uh, Avenue of the Dead. And you, you're, you stop and your, your mission there is to contemplate your death for a minute, you know, just face it. And it is a, it is a ceremony. It's not, I mean, you, you know, there, there's nobody standing there that's going to kill you, but but just to focus the, your attention on that for a while is, is very useful. And interestingly, at one time, um, oh yeah, one of, one of the students will be the angel of death and that they won't let you pass until you're ready to go. And one time I was doing that and the, the, the angel of death was my friend, Susan. I can't think of her last name right now, but she's a featured girl. And she made me go back to the end of the line and start over twice. And I, I, I thought, now, why is she doing that? And probably because I'm, I'm just not afraid of death anymore. You know, I mean, it's, I've been <clears throat> so close so often that it's just like, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've been, I've been in a situation of being bleeding out, you know, and, and getting it stopped at the last minute and a couple of times. And when that happened, I really, okay, I can do this. You know, if, if I, let me see if I can come up with some good last words, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> something that will be talked about in officer clubs for years to come. And I never did do that, but it was just like, okay, this is, this is business as usual. So anyway, so that's probably why she made me go back twice because uh, I, I didn't look at all stressed because I wasn't stressed. <clears throat> but that's, that's one of the exercises and, and it's one of the best. It's, yeah. oh God, that ceremony is, like I said, it's three days and it, it's, and <clears throat> the first time I did it, I said, what do you do for an encore? And I said that to Ted Race, and he said, it's like layers of an onion. Every time you do it, you just peel, up, peel off another layer. Mm. And I've done it six times, and the guy I was talking to had done it, I think, 20. Wow. You know, because he was, he, was, he, was he was a teacher there. And he, he just said, you know, it's, no, every, every time is as, as powerful as the first time. And it truly is. Mm. Yeah, and uh, they still run these. Uh, uh, I don't know. I guess ceremony is probably the best word for it. I don't yeah. think retreat is quite right. Workshop doesn't seem correct either. But the ceremonies in uh, Teotihuacan, they still right. run those every year, correct? I think. Miguel still does it. His sons do it. Various teachers do. They have slight variations that they've built into it. But yeah, it's a powerful ceremony. And uh, I mean, I have seen people shaking like jackhammers on the ground. I've seen uh, at the end of at the end of it, at one time, we were on top of the Pyramid of the Sun and the whole mob just collapsed. And I, I was looking at, again, at Suzanne, my friend Suzanne, and I was looking at her foot and there was a halo around it. And I got up and looked at the group and there was, there was a, a visible halo around that entire group of people. We were just, just, it was an amazing thing. It was a visible aura that, I, I mean, it was as visible as a, as a football in a football game. It was just there, mm. you know, and very, various other things like during parts of it, you'll feel, you'll feel power going through your body. Like, like you just stuck your toe in a light socket. I mean, it's, <laughs> really something oh wow. really something yeah so this is all i would imagine that 
you've ended up seeing the world in a very different way than what you did when you started out, you know, you know, like as a teenager, uh, in the military school and whatnot, you probably have a very different way that the thinking of how the world works and with energy and things like that. Is that, well, accurate? one of the things, one of the things that you discover is, okay, it's, I think it will be a recognized scientific principle in time, but first of all, space is not empty. Mm. It's filled with plasma, which is like a gas that's lighter than gas. You know, I mean, it's just, it's almost not there, but almost is not, not there. And Rupert Sheldrake, who, uh, he calls it the morphic field. Right. And uh, one of my, you know, I mean, once you get through the Toltec training is kind of like, kind of like basic, you know, uh, once you're through with it, you're, it's not like you're through with it. You're, you're ready to start, hmm. you know, making your way in this new world and, and finding out how to use it effectively. And you find out that you can, you know, you're not, you're not tied to your body. You're not, you know, all of those things, all those things you can do. You can, you can have out of body experiences. You can lucid dream. You can yada, yada, yada. And I still do a lot of that. Now, a lot of it, interestingly enough to me is tied to things that we actually do in normal society, but call it something else. Writing fiction is kind of a lucid dream. Mm. You know, and a lot of the things that we do, uh, psychologists are shamans in a way, you know, and in fact, I would say that of the Toltec students that I've met, the largest single job that most of them do, I mean, it's, it's, it's a small percentage, it's, but it's like 5% or 8% of the people who get involved in the Toltec work are clinical psychologists mm. and they use it in their treatment and they're in their, you know, they use it all the time. They maybe don't tell anybody that they're, you know, they don't, they don't tell the American psychological association that they're using it, but they do. Mm. And they're using it very successfully with their, with their clients. Yeah. My, my understanding, uh, having read the four agreements, I know that Don Miguel talks about domestication, I think. Yeah. And what immediately came to my mind was that in psychology, the way that that's worded is conditioning and right. that, you know, he talks about how we are unaware, you know, he, he refers to us as being self-domesticated. And the way I read that was always that we're unaware of our own conditioning. And we're also unaware of how we condition ourselves. And it seems like much of this work is to wake up to that, to that fact, to. Well, in, in my own life, I can, I can attest that several generations of soldiers have been conditioned by John Wayne movies. Mm. You know, I mean, there's still, we had one kid in Vietnam and God, this poor kid, he threw a grenade into a thatch hut hut and then plastered himself against the wall of the hut you know just like he'd seen john wayne do in some movie in a in a inside a building where the wall would actually stop the grenade fragments the kid killed himself that way yeah that's really unfortunate and you know it a lot of this brings to mind other conversations i've had because it seems like that there's this aspect of living in kind of illusion, living in a bit of a dream, uh, sure. in a dream world, and that much of this work and the work that you've gone through has been this attempt to wake up from this dream. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's okay. One of the things that in the very first, in the first chapter of the first book, Castaneda says, we don't perceive the world directly. And we don't. I mean, we perceive it through five senses. And five senses arrange it into the familiar thing that we deal with. But 
the world out there is just a vibe mm. you know it's 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 a frequency of vibrations and we each of our each of our senses translates a different frequency of vibrations we have no we have no certainty that we i'm in fact i'm pretty sure that we all see it similarly but we don't see it exactly the same mm. um and a lot of it is projection you know i mean once you once you once you get a world view then you pr start pr projecting that world view on the world that you perceive and you miss all the things that don't fit the world view and um well you see where i'm going with that and sure. i think sure. that's where you're going as well yeah 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 well it's uh if i remember right um don miguel kind of says that we do that in in our doing of that we sort of create hell on earth um well yeah show sure enough yeah yeah and it um, is the goal seems to be in his work is to kind of do the opposite to create heaven on earth well one of the one of the things that i've learned from this is that getting what you want will not make you happy right. but here's a weird thing being happy will get you what you want mm. you have to start with that you've got to get your attitude right and then the world will just kind of fall in the line you know it may not be exactly as you envisioned it but it'll be pretty close yeah that seems to be a message that i keep hearing more and more uh, uh and reading more and more from a lot of people that it is this idea of I don't know how I want to state this, but it's, um, I guess it's the, the vibration that you just mentioned that if you have the good vibration, you're going to attract more things. If you focus on yeah, yeah. what's good rather than the lack, because if you keep focusing on the lack of things, you're just going to keep inviting more lack into your life. Oh, you get caught in a feedback loop because if you're attuning your while you're attuning yourself to the world, the world is attuning itself to you. Mm. One of the, uh, and you can, well, one of the, one of the great teachers of this stuff, because she keeps it simple, stupid is Esther Hicks, mm. you know, the law of attraction lady. Right. And everything she teaches is quite right, but it's hard to master, mm -hmm. you know, but if, if you, it can be mastered and it can be made to work for you. Yeah. Well, it seems like part of a major part of having this work is to, and I don't know the best word here, but it would either be release or surrender to kind of release ourselves or uh, from the ideas that we have about ourselves the ideas that we have about the world to release ourselves from focusing on the lack yeah yeah that's entirely true it also seems to me uh, i'm gonna um uh, get us to a certain point here i know we're gonna start running out of time here pretty soon it seems like a lot of this work and what you have gone through is about learning to love yourself and to forgive yourself. Yeah. Uh, the last, okay. Uh, you know, from my book that my, my wife Myrna died in 2019 and the, the best I've ever done with this, with the Toltec work is to make her last years as good as they could have been. And she was, you know, she was paralyzed. She had dementia. She was in, a, she was in a bad way, but uh, I learned to I learned to be happy and keep her happy while we were doing that, and it was a bit of a triumph, actually. Mm. Yeah, it comes across when you write about it in the book that you know it could be incredibly sad i mean from a reader's point of view it was not it didn't come across that way it came across as 
almost life affirming in a sense the way well that- it is i mean i'm okay i've i've recently i've been studying a lot about death and you know i started all that with the sith books which were mm-hmm. fascinating mm-hmm. and apparently if you buy into all of that and i tentatively kind of do i try not to believe anything I ascribe orders of probability. Yeah. <laughs> and life after death, I have now ascribed more than a 50% probability to. But I feel like I'm in touch with her. Mm. You know, now I don't, I don't hear her voice or she doesn't appear to me in a, a magical vision or any of that. I just feel her around. And you could say, well, that's just your mind. Well, yeah, what isn't, but, but I, you know, I think it's, I don't think it's just me. I think it's her. Mm. Yeah. 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 Probably so. I try to do the same thing, not to hold on to belief so much. I like how you framed it as thinking in terms of the probabilities for me, mostly it's try trying to reject ideas of certainty, because I think it's when we are absolute, when we feel that we're absolutely certain about something, that that's what gets us into all sorts of trouble. Oh yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. For sure. There, nothing is for certain. And your perception of it is your perception is not objective truth. Right. Right. And, and I think more people will need to remember. There is no objective truth. Yeah. 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 It would be nice if more people recognize that fact. (laughs) I think a lot of the problems that we're having right now is way too many people claiming absolute truth. My stepdad had a great phrase about his boss often in error, seldom in doubt. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So you, wrote this book and, you know, in the book, you even mentioned that, you know, what was important was the writing of it, not necessarily the publishing of it. And that you didn't even know if anyone other than like your grandson would read it. You know, I've read it. I know a few others have read it. It also seems that one of the reasons that you wrote it was for your fellow veterans. Is that true? Well, yeah, because, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's a thing, God, mm-hmm. everybody that comes home has, a, has an adjustment problem. Right. And some of them have really serious adjustment problems. I read somewhere that like 20 GIs kill themselves, X GIs kill themselves a week, something like yeah. that. Well, Jesus, you know, that's not, I would be interested to know how much, how, how, how much higher the suicide rate is among veterans as compared to the general population, but obviously it's a little higher. Yeah. Maybe a lot higher. Yeah. And, yeah. And if, if, if I can get some guy started and I don't care how he does it, you know, I mean, I've met really cool Pentecostal preachers, you know, and I don't, for me, a fundamentalist is somebody that can't tell the difference between a poem and a blueprint. Yeah. But nonetheless, I know, well, I have, I have a nephew and I, I was saying to my sister who, you know, I've, I've, I've written a nice book about this stuff, but she can do it way better than I can. Mm. And I was, I was saying, God, I just get so tired of this Jesus rap, you know, I mean, it's, and I'm a big fan of Jesus, but I get tired of his Jesus rap. And she said, he'd be dead without it. Yeah. And I think, yeah, you're probably right. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I know that the numbers for veterans committing suicide is really, really high. And I also think it's true that this nation, unfortunately, does not take care of our veterans as we should, especially given what we ask of them. And I know that the situation and attitudes have changed since Vietnam. I mean, the soldiers in Vietnam were definitely not welcomed home with open arms. 
And now I think the social attitudes have changed, but we still don't take care of the, the vets. Well, let's um, take it back a little to. further. You know, I mean, when the guys came home from World War II, they had saved the world and everybody knew right. it and they were heroes. And, you know, they had their parades and all that, but, but they also got elected. To, I mean, if, if, if all other things being equal, if you were a veteran, you got the job. You got the office, you got all of that stuff. I mean, those guys were held in high regard and it wasn't quite that way after Korea, but uh, there was still some residual traces of that after Korea. And the Vietnam, the reason that I, I feel that the reason that Vietnam veterans were, you know, there was plenty of reason not to go to Vietnam if you didn't want to go. But if you're a guy and your country's at war, it makes sense if you can prove that anybody that goes to war is an idiot and probably crazy. And that was, that was kind of the, the myth that, that came home with us mm. <clears throat> or the, what, the myth that we came home to. One of my best friends is Ken Miller, who is another Vietnam vet author. He, he, car he still carries a lot of rage, Ken does. And he, he was quoting this thing. He wrote a great novel called Tiger the Lurp Dog. It's my, my favorite Vietnam novel by an American GI. And my actual favorite Vietnam novel is by a North Vietnamese guy, The Tsar of War, but Bao Ninh, but which Ken turned me on to that book, but he read this thing in, in uh, the New York Times where the, where the author of this piece, I guess it was an opinion piece, said, Vietnam is going to be a war where that is written about mostly by people who didn't go there because obviously anybody that went there is too stupid to write a book. Wow. And Ken likes to point out that six members of his company have written books about their experiences and published them. And they're pretty good books. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was a small company. It was a long range reconnaissance patrol company. There were only like maybe 60 guys in it. So like every 10th or 12th guy in his unit wrote a book about his experiences because they did have those experiences that were, you know, worth, worth reading about. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, you know, you, you kind of make your friends out of people who have experiences similar to your own. And uh, I would say that of all of my friends, more about half of them are Vietnam veterans. And of those, more than half of those Vietnam veterans have written books about it. Now, on the other hand, more than half of my friends were used to be acid heads and which, okay, that, here, this is interesting too. Of the guys that I, was you know hanging out with when i was doing all that <clears throat> my best friend wound up the the executive vice president of a multinational corporation if i were to tell you the name of the corporation you'd recognize it immediately and you know his annual salary was in excess of three hundred thousand dollars so i think we can take it on good authority that lsd did not fry his brain one of my ex, my ex roommate, one of my ex roommates is a millionaire developer in Dallas. Another one is he's probably retired now, but he was a district judge. And in fact, if you, if you call the courthouse and, and ask for Gino, he would re recess court because he didn't want any of his clerks talking to that guy. Mm. <laughs> and you know, I mean, out, out of all of those guys that I, I hung out with, most of them have made a tremendous success in life. We did have one big chill guy who, who he went to the hospital and before he got out, his heart exploded. So, and he was maybe, he wasn't even 30 when that happened. So, oh. so it, you know, it, you can go wrong with it. There's no two ways about that, but right. for the most part, it's, I think it's been a positive influence on the lives of the people who used it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Steve Jobs, I think, said that it was one of the most important things he ever did in his life. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, you, yeah. you, you, well, 
yeah, uh, someone recently asked me, what, what are the effects? And I said, well, it lets you out of the box you're in into a larger room. Mm. It won't get you outside. You know, you got to get outside on your own. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, when I know some of the studies that have been done recently, in particular, the organization MAPS, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, uh, yeah. they're really behind a lot of the movement towards legalization for the psychedelic substances in therapeutic settings. And I believe that they have actually done a lot of um, or supported research with veterans and post-traumatic stress disorder with MDMA, uh, with ecstasy. Yeah. So, um, well, I, I have taken MDMA and, but the results were essentially what you could get with an hour of meditation. Yeah. Yeah. At least that was my experience. Yeah. And so I wasn't bothered with it again. It was just kind of an experiment. Right. Yeah. I, I've only done MDMA once and it, it, and I didn't do it in a psychedelic or a therapeutic or healing kind of way. It was when it was popular back in the nineties to take it at like dance clubs and whatnot. So yeah. it was, I was in England at what was supposed to be their premier nightclub and took MDMA. And the way I always describe it is I dance so hard that my nipples hurt for three days after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but that was about the extent of it but I, I i think other substances and i think it can actually have really therapeutic values too they've demonstrated that it can but i was curious along these lines the the book that you've written and the experiences that you have and the wisdom that you have to share have you thought about doing anything more directly working with veterans to try to help them to overcome some of these issues that they're facing? Well, I've thought about it. It, it just hasn't come about. And truthfully, you know, we haven't, we haven't discussed this, but I'm 85 now. Yeah. And I just don't quite get around much like I used to. Right. You know, but you know, it, it's like, I, I work out a lot, but I, I don't work out to be the fastest or the strongest or uh, any of that. I work out to do normal stuff normally. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm actually scouting about for now, I've kind of said everything I've got to say, <clears throat> but there are, there are things that interest me now that I'm, I'm curious about. And so I think I'm going to start on a, another, I wouldn't call it scholarship, but a little bit of an intellectual and physical exploration and see if I can come up with something else mm. that would, that's worth writing about because right. that's, you know, that's what I'm good at. Right. <clears throat> I'm not, I've tried teaching and, you know, I was a graduate assistant for a number of years and taught, I've taught college journalism and college English and all of that. But when I started to teach this Toltec stuff, I just kind of fumbled around and I wasn't, wasn't at all happy with what I was doing. I mean, I, have, I know the, I know the good Toltec teachers and they're just so natural and so easy and so smooth that, and I wasn't in that category at all. So what I need to do is pick up some new body of knowledge and refine it and smooth it and turn it into something that somebody can read and understand yeah. and have fun doing it. Yeah. 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 I was wondering about that, if maybe that might be your next step, because, you know, as you noted, and I, we had mentioned before that this book is, you know, it's your spiritual healing biography, but it's not a, how-to book it's not a philosophical spiritual book uh and i was just curious given what you know and understand well, there, and there's a lot you. there's enough there's enough things you can do described in this book that if you did those things you'd learn yeah. a lot right 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 uh, yeah but it's yeah but it's not a it's not a manual it's not a it's not a uh, a teaching book yeah. at all it's an adventure tale 
Yeah, yeah. Because that's what I write, you know. Yeah. I mean, before before I went in the army, I used to read adventure tales, and then I wanted to have some adventures, so I went off and had adventures, and then yeah. came back and wrote that up. And my my most successful books have been. I've just gone off and done some cockamamie thing and then come back and written it up. Mm. And I've written fiction books and they've been moderately successful, but they're not as good as my nonfiction. I have to recognize that. Yeah. Well, I, I was curious what you're going to work on next. And you kind of answered that question because you did write in the book that writing is what you do. Yeah. Well, I used to, I used to live in, in the United States. Now I live in the galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, kind of interested in exploring that you know i mean it would appear or maybe not appear it's hard to say that we live in a world in which uh, extraterrestrial visitors are zooming around checking us out mm -hmm. and that may or not may not be true and uh either way it says so much about our society mm -hmm. you know for instance yeah. conventional science they're starting to change, but mostly they've just said, no, no, there's nothing to this. This is the morphic field. Forget about it. Not true. Uh, uh, UFOs, nonsense, never happened. Uh, that's fantasy stuff. And then on the other side, you've got people that absolutely are absolutely sure that they are, you know, channeling extraterrestrials from Sirius who are giving them philosophical dissertations. Yeah. And these are very different kinds of people. What mm -hmm. does it say about our society if we have these these different kinds of people? What does it say that we have people who refuse to believe anything as opposed to we have other people who will believe damn, damn near anything? Right. <laughs> anything at all. Yeah. Yeah, I have interest in all that topic too. I'm going to have a guest on. Probably it won't air until October, but he's done a lot of work i think in what people are referring to as a kind of a unified sort of theory for all of this because oh, ufos really? yeah ufos seem to be uh, there seems to be something connected to consciousness with them and uh, there have been others that have explored this i think the most famous would be jacques fillet right uh, you know have you read have you read trinity his latest uh, book? No, I've not. It's recommended. Highly recommended. Read yeah. Trinity. It'll. It's. It's. It's quite a tale. Yeah. Uh, and it's. It's. It's on the nonfiction shelves. You know, he didn't make it up. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I haven't really explored this in the podcast. So the guest coming up, Josh uh, Kuchins, I think his last name. He's going to be the first, but it's always been an area of interest of mine the connections between this and the folklore. And there's some really interesting work being done in that right now. Well, I've seen three UFOs myself. Yeah. And none of them were the traditional disc shaped flying saucer thing. The first one was in Vietnam. And it was the only time in Vietnam I ever camped in the open. And, you know, we had, we had the fires out at, at dark because we want to give our position away. We couldn't talk. We couldn't smoke. We couldn't do anything. We just lie there. And so I was just lying there looking up at the sky. And all of a sudden, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the, one of the stars went from there over to there. Wow. So I thought, well, now that's interesting. You don't see that every day. That wasn't a meteor because it just stopped. And so I kept my eyes on that star. And after a while, it went from there over to there. And so I kept my eyes on it again, and then it just went off, off the edge of the thing. Another time, I was gassing up my car in L.A., and I happened to look, and I saw what looked like a three-mile-across translucent donut in the sky. Hmm. And I'd never read about anything like that. I'd never seen anything like that. I didn't know what to make of it. But there is a guy who writes about that stuff who I had always considered pretty much a whack job named Stuart Wilde. And, but I was, one of my Toltec friends was interested in him. And so I started reading a little of him and he absolutely described perfectly 
what I had seen. It was exactly the same thing. And I, I realized, okay. And he, he called it an interdimensional portal. Mm -hmm. I have no idea if that's what it was. I have no idea if it was a trick of the light. I have no idea at all. But, um, but I saw it. Yeah. Three o'clock yeah. in the afternoon. Yeah. It, SO station. Yeah. It seems like there's a trickster element to a lot of the uh, UAP, I guess is what they call them now, the unidentified aerial phenomena. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, um, yeah. Those guys are having a little fun with us in addition to everything else. They, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well if I were an interdimensional being or extraterrestrial, I think I'd do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> You know. Well, you could make a case that we are interdimensional beings, but yeah. well, okay, that's that's not this discussion. That's another right, right. discussion. Yeah, yeah I'm unprepared sure. for that discussion at this time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, Jim, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me, and maybe some other time we can have that conversation about the interdimensional beings. Well, you'll have to wait several years, and in several years, I'll be ninety. So yeah. we'll see how that works out. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but yeah, maybe that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Anyway, I'd like to thank you for this, uh, for this conversation. You know, sure. it's, it was fun for me. Good. And yeah. uh, I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed the book and I do highly recommend it. I think that anyone can find something of great value and entertainment in it. It was really well done. So congratulations on that. You're talking about the dreaming circus, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Nick. which is a really good title for you know uh, all these interdimensional being things anyway too right we're all kind of dreaming yeah yeah all right all, all right. right you take care jim thank you again you too all adios right. all right and that's a wrap on episode 47 of rebel spirit radio thank you so much for listening or watching if you're part of my youtube audience if you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts, especially if you listen to this on Apple. It only takes a second and your five-star ratings really do help. If you have a minute to spare, please consider posting a short but positive review and please consider subscribing. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. Also, if you think a friend or family member would like this podcast, please share it with them. Right now, that is one of the best ways to help me with the podcast. I really do need to grow the audience. I also have a PayPal link set up if you would like to make a one-time donation. And hey, you can be the first person to do so. You can find the link for that in the show notes or video description. I'm also going to be launching a Patreon within the next few months, so tune back in to keep posted on that. I have big plans for Rebel Spirit beyond the podcast. I really do want to create more video content for the YouTube channel, and I'm planning on some live stream episodes. The first will be with returning guest Dr. Sharon Kogan, where she will offer a Jungian analysis and interpretation of dreams for participants. We're still working on scheduling this, but it will likely be near the end of October. So be sure to follow Rebel Spirit Radio on Facebook and or sign up for the newsletter at rebelspiritradio.com so you can be informed of all future live events and the uh, Patreon when it goes live. Uh, all of this is going to take a lot of time and energy, and so your help, any help, is greatly appreciated. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be at peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.